Hello everyone and welcome back to part two of this Project Ascension Beginners tutorial and playthrough. Today we're going to talk about more basics of Ascension, what items to start hoarding to turn in into gold later on, and the featured topic of this video, professions. Are they worth it? What's the difference about them in Ascension? What is high risk and what's up with those materials? A reminder that I am playing a character from level one in this series, so check out part one if you haven't already, it should be here on the screen. But if you're here for something specific, take a look down below at the timestamps and find what you need. I'm Halen, let's get back into it. One of the big questions I see a lot in newcomer chat is uh, what are I, you know, do I have to go to all the trainers to learn my abilities separately? Um, in the starting zone, there's these books of ascension. So this yellow one here, uh, you can actually see all of your abilities and train them all at once right here and players can also have these pets for example i have one here and other people can use this if they walk up to it and click on it and you can even choose to filter by class trainers and see look mine pops up this other person's pops up like everyone's is here so that's all you have to do when you're in a capital city you're bound to find one um, in the town center um, you could always just slash S, which is say in chat, and ask for a book of Ascension. Um, there's also this Beginner's Book of Artisans here, too. And these Beginner's ones, it, they will not train everything. Uh, they'll just train, like, the very first versions. I believe probably level 10 or less. In the case of the Book of Artisans, this is just essentially a way for you to pick from all the different professions. So the other benefit of using this one here is it doesn't cost you anything to train these. So I can go ahead and get all my, you know, my secondaries, and then I can pick others. So uh, Ascension also has a new profession called wood cutting, allows you to cut down trees, and it's actually a pretty good XP. And uh, don't sell your low-level crafting materials because there's quests in the end game that uh, allow you to do a turn in and get material, get currency for the uh, rerolls and such, and then people will. Whenever those quests are up that day, you know, your linen cloth may go from worthless to over a gold a stack or a gold, uh, you know, one or two gold for one bandage. So uh, it's, it's a good idea to keep like the most basic crafting materials because they may make you money later. Of course, if you're tight on inventory space, maybe you don't want to do that. As a hunter, I want to go with a typical let's see, skinning and let's do leather worker i like that combo it just feels good making use of the things that uh that i kill you know and if you level up or if you're doing something that is of uh, appropriate level like skinning if it's at least green uh you're going to get xp for that as well so it's kind of just free xp crafting and ascension has all the same things as normal wow which means the vast majority of it is useless and classic content Fortunately, Ascension has added high-risk materials and recipes to the game. High-risk is where you flag yourself for PvP out in the open world. And depending on if you're in a high-risk zone 1, 2, or 3, you may lose some items in your inventory, and you may also lose some gear that you have equipped. Now, there is a system called Fail Commutation that allows you to pay a fee instead of losing your items. But unless you're focusing on PvP and actually trying to win fights or keep your best in slot PvP gear, it's probably more cost effective to buy a cheap set of gear that's high enough item level for you to go out and farm the events. And that way, if you die and you lose the piece, you can just replace it for an amount of gold that's probably less than the fell commutation fee. By the way, when gear drops in high risk, it becomes Bloodforged. Bloodforged gear will have resilience and PvP power stats on it, and it will also make it tradable. Now you may think this is broken and allows players to attain gear in a roundabout way. However, wearing this gear and higher raid content will give you a debuff that reduces your damage and healing done by 20% and increases your damage taken by 20%. This debuff will usually result in you getting kicked from a raid. Now let's talk about the materials that you can farm and then the items you can make with those materials. I'm going to focus on the consumables and weapon enchants that are used a lot in in-game. I would imagine they get used in PvP, however I'm not a big PvP player, but they're definitely used as the consumables for in-game raiding, Mythic Plus, etc. Now you may think that 
high risk open world PvP farming sounds uh, terrifying or a chaotic version of just normal open world farming. However, in my experience, that is not the case. Sure, you do have the rush of running into another player and thinking, oh, I could die here and lose some items, but sometimes you'll be out farming for 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, and not see a single player. Like all farming, it depends on the location and the server population at the time. And sometimes it depends on the type of player that's farming. They may have no interest in fighting you either. But high risk is also really popular right now for farming scrolls for the rerolls. So there's also a greater population of players that might be out there to simply farm and PVE this mode um, and not really want to fight you. If you're afraid to go by yourself, you can do this in groups as well. To turn on high risk, simply press the H key, read the tooltips, of course, and then click enter high risk. While in high risk, you will have a chance when farming nodes, skinning, etc., to get high risk components. However, you can also get these and some bonus drop items by killing mobs in areas marked on the map for the respective type of material. So if you see one for ores, that means you can kill mobs here and get ores drops, not only from just farming ore nodes. To see how the high risk materials or components work, and what kinds of items you can craft using these materials, I'm going to hop over to the Ascension database. I think the database is a severely underutilized resource for Ascension players, so I'm trying to use it as much as possible as an education tool. To demonstrate some of the things that you can craft and all the materials that drop in high risk, I'm gonna navigate down to the database dropdown and professions and skills. And today we're gonna to talk about one of the consumables that gets used a lot, at least for rating and alchemy is used to create flasks. So here I'm going to search for flasks and then I'm gonna sort by skill because this is going to include everything in the game through Wrath of the Lich King, even though that's not available to us right now, but they have added items for it. And we're gonna stop at alchemy level 300 because that is the cap for classic content. So here we can see that there are purple versions or epic versions of the flasks. And if we come down here, you see that these names switch from concentrated to distilled. And distilled are the blue versions. This is a theme for the consumables like food uh, and flasks to differentiate between the blue and purple. They'll have like a modifier adjective or verb at the beginning. And in terms of food, they will separate the stats that they give and they'll categorize them in things like wontons, soup, steak, that sort of thing, along with other words, modifiers, depending on if they give like a main stat or a tertiary stat like haste or armor pin. Okay, so let's look at one of these items or we're gonna come down here to the blue versions, the distilled, and we can see it takes one healthy demon bloom, a healthy sanguine vine, golden sam sam, which most players of WoW should know. That's just a normal herb that you can go out and farm. And then four essences of undeath. And that's another thing I like about the high risk crafting system is that adding new recipes to the game, you can take in some materials that would otherwise be overflowing in people's bags or banks and maybe not used for anything and you create a market for them. Essence of undeath, as you can see, this one takes four and these other ones it only takes like two and one of the other type of elementals. Uh, that's because Essence of Undeath, they drop quite a bit because we have a lot of in-game activities that take place where we kill mobs that drop these. Let's just go up. This one takes the same thing, Healthy Sanguine Vine, but this one takes a Healthy Core Root and a Sanguine Vine. And this is the three different types of materials that we get in high risk in Classic. We have Sanguine, Demon, and Core. If we scroll down, we can take a peek at some TBC recipes and we see that they have uh, Twisted, Nether, and Void. And you'll notice when you look at the different high risk tier zones that Sanguine, they drop almost everywhere. And then Core, they will drop at a higher rate. Um, normally you have to actually be in the event areas or killing the event mob in order to get these to drop at a reliable drop rate. And then Demon, as you can see, even in this tooltip, it says it only drops from tier two and tier three. So you can't even get this in tier one, whereas you can get these in tier one. Now we also need to talk about how these 
items here are even made. So we can go ahead and click on one of these. We'll click on the flask of the executioner and we'll go into, actually, I guess I could have clicked on this directly. So we'll go in here to healthy core root because you will not see this drop directly in game. What you'll see drop are core spore sacks. Uh, and it takes five of these to turn into a healthy core root. So you'll go out into the open world and you will farm these core spore sacks. And once you get five of them, you can take them to a sanguine workbench, which is a special type of crafting table, much like a cooking fire or an anvil. And when you're near it, you can click on these if you're an alchemist. So just like the tooltip says here, and you will cultivate a healthy core root, which is what you need to create the flask. And the high risk system for materials, there is also even smaller components that will drop. And you'll notice this whenever you're farming in the areas that are marked on the map, the high risk events. A lot of the bonus items are these other types of items or smaller tiered that you'll get a lot of them. They'll drop into your bags, but you can combine them in order to turn into the next tier. So here we can see it goes from green to blue. So it takes, you know, five of these to get one of these, but then it takes five of the core spore sacks to get the next tier. So they all kind of pyramid up into a, into a point. You'll see that these don't even take being an alchemist though. So you can combine these to save backspace uh, or, you know, inventory, but you have to be at a sanguine workbench so you couldn't do it while you're out farming. But there's also a second clause here that says combining these has a chance to create marks of war, which is not really on the crafting topic, but you get them as a byproduct for crafting high risk, which is good because they can give you marks of ascension. It doesn't say it here, but combining almost all tiers, if I'm not mistaken, every tier of high risk materials will give you a mark of war of, of differing levels. There's a bunch of different ones. They go from 10 to copper, bronze, silver, gold, and consuming those marks of war will give you marks of ascension. And they are also tradable and uh, technically an unlimited source of marks of ascension. So all people have to do is go and farm them or buy them from the auction house and they will get those. In my experience, the marks of war are actually a very good source of income. I'm just farming to save some gold in order to fuel my rating in the end game so I don't have to buy consumables from other people and obtaining these marks of war turning around and selling them on the auction house that is a great source of income on top of selling all the extra materials that I may not need I think I said it already but every profession has an end game application for high risk alchemy has flasks blacksmithing has belt buckles that you can put on the belt slot uh, of your armor pieces that will give you extra stats enchanting their main high risk thing is uh, weapon enchants, which are very powerful. These are some of the most expensive consumables that uh, you will buy. Uh, to, well, they're enchantments, but they are consumed upon use. But they are super impactful, and I probably had one on the thumbnail of this video, and I'll try to put one up on the screen now. Engineering, they have these polishes, which you can put on the relic slot. Essentially, as you can see, these all focus on that particular slot because you also have scopes for your ranged weapon. So anything that goes in the ranged or relic slot, there will be an enchantment for that. For jewel crafting, we have things that affect the neck slot. So here we can see these twisted pendants or void pendant. So they're pendants that they will add stats to your necklace. And this is an enchantment. Leatherworking is all about the gambesons. Those go onto your chest piece and are permanent. A lot of people forget about this one for some reason. And tailoring gets a double dip here. They get things like the cloak lining, which are permanent enchantments for the cloak or back slot. However, as you can see, they're not as impactful. And for that reason, I think they added another item they can craft with high risk, which are called wraps. Well, I guess they weren't in the list of craftable items on the profession page, but they're called wrist wraps. And these are temporary or consumable items, and they will give you a small boost in certain stats. So here you see critical strike, damage done by 2%. So it's usually around a 2 or 3% range. 
I think these just came in season nine and people are still getting used to dropping the gold or materials to craft these. In my opinion, they have a pretty steep cost for the short duration. I think they should be at least two hours, like a flask, because I'm getting increased 2% damage, which is a lot, just flat damage, for example, here. But they do cost a lot to actually make. All right, I'm gonna turn in my first quest here. As you can see, it will give you some marks of ascension. So you already start building up a pile of this currency, which you'll see how it's used in the end game. And you also get an adventurer's cash. So we're gonna go ahead and complete that. This adventurer's cash will scale up with you. So if I wait to open this, it will give me something higher. But for now, I'm just gonna open it to show you what's in it. Now we'll get a case of fortune, which will give me those re-rolls. So if I press in and go back to the character advancement, see down here, I have one re-roll. One clarification about the adventurer's cash, if you keep them until level 60, they will not give you a scroll of fortune or a case of scroll of fortune. So it is best to open these while you're leveling to get those scrolls and just pieces of gear that may help you along the way. The other cool thing is uh, if, if I didn't have these heirlooms, you know, like I just got a set of shoulders from that box. Normally in WoW, like normal wow you wouldn't see shoulders until like level 20 so it's a it's a good thing to pick those up to open those up i mean if you really aren't feeling the leveling speed like you want to go fast you could always type in the chat and look for a group of players that are making use of the xp items there is one that is an aura where if one person has it the whole party will benefit from it and you have to be in range most people probably want someone who's prestiging so it'll actually be a prestige but you never know there might be some kind-hearted people out there that if you whisper them say hey i'm a new player i just want to level fast can i join your group you know maybe you can just tag along even though you will probably level slower because you do not have heirlooms and most people probably will have at least a handful of them but if you set up two-factor and i think verify your email do a couple other things on the website you will get a currency called i believe it's it's loyalty points it's a sh lp for short and lp can be used to buy some potions of experience and you know you can get those for free so if you are really you know wanting to go 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 you don't want to wait then i recommend going to do those things on the website to get the free lp buying some potions which are going to be soul bound you can't sell those like on the auction house or anything man I don't play enough ally. I have no idea where I'm going. Apparently it's over there. Now that I'm level 10, uh, I get to roll my first ability, which may be one of my cards. Uh, I think I have a card for Wrath, which I'm now, re now realizing I actually wanted to roll um, Expunge which I don't know if I can replace. Okay, Ooh, I can't. I had gotten this card uh, since I set my character up and I want to do that. I think if I click this to roll it, it would have counted me rolling past level nine, um, which I will explain that later whenever we talk about opening up new specializations, how you can essentially pick your abilities from, even though you're level 60, when you learn a new specialization, which that's how you create like, different versions of your characters so you don't have to replace the build that you make every single time you can just open up a different spec which does cost something but i'll show you later on now that that uh crisis has been averted i have something called wild wrath here it makes it so i can get an instant cast wrath um, which refreshes insect swarm on the target which synergizes with another thing and it resets the cooldown of chimera shot my build, I guess I haven't really talked about it, but the idea behind my build is to reduce the cooldown or reset Chimera Shot so that I can constantly be, well, shooting that. And Chimera Shot, it deals instantly deals 90% of my Serpent Sting damage. So this is nature, that's nature, nature, this is all nature damage. And Plague Swarm, by the way, is another version of Insect Swarm that I have here. And the reason I want Insect Swarm is because there are going to be some synergies with Insect Swarm and Serpent Sting and being able to do more damage there. So I have here, every time I deal damage with Steady Shot, reduces the Come Here Shot cooldown by two seconds. 
this wild wrath whenever i cast it with three stacks it'll reset the cooldown of chimera shot and refresh my insect swarm so it's essentially just free constant damage the thing that i replaced was this expunge which will deal nature damage every three seconds and then i get this every time i shoot chimera shot so being able to spam chimera shot gets me up to the three stacks so it says if it reaches three stacks then the cobra venom is expunged and it deals 68 damage to enemies within 10 yards and it should deal damage to the actual target as well i built something similar to this last season and this did a lot of damage so i'm hoping it does a lot more damage now and then there's the locust ranger wild quiver talent so since i'll be spamming steady shot whenever chimera shots uh, on cooldown every time i shoot steady shot and it hits a target that's stung by my serpent sting it will trigger my wild quiver which is yet another ability that deals nature damage it doesn't consume ammo and it's just free damage it just happens when i'm doing my normal thing and then finally this card here is called naturally strong there's one of these for each combination of two magic schools so this one is nature and physical when I deal nature damage, I increase my physical damage. When I deal physical damage, I increase my nature damage. So Chimera Shot is physical and almost everything else is nature. So that's the build and that's what we're gonna be going for. And now that I'm at level 10, I can progress this. All right, so I'm gonna roll that. Okay, this will be something you see so, so you don't get confused or scared. Uh, it's just confirming that these are the four skills that you want for your level one. You're not gonna be able to change these technically it's one to nine so this is like a final check and you have a chance to re-roll them now which is kind of cool because if you've been leveling maybe you feel like oh this is clunky or these things will interact the way i thought they did so this is your last chance to rethink that but i am ready this is what i want to go with so i'm going to reveal a new spell and yes it is wrath because i had that carded here and it was a level one ability Oh, I also need to roll a talent because I get one of these every level and I get an ability every two levels. And my first talent is that other carded one, Naturally Strong. All right, so we got to level 10 and we spent a lot of time getting hyped about professions. I wanted to do a featured topic in each video and there really wasn't anything else in the earlier leveling stages. Getting professions early can give you a boost in experience and be something you may actually do while leveling your first time through. After that, it's all go, go, go on prestige runs. Thanks to all the new subs, likes, and comments in the last video, and please let me know how you're liking this slightly more in-depth and polished version. I'm trying to make these relevant for at least the remainder of the season, but I'm also working on getting them out faster. The next video should focus on strategic re-rolling at certain levels before you hit level 60, and more of the leveling experience in Ascension. So make sure to tune back in for that one. Again, this is Halen. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.